So in this video, I'm going to tell you everything that comes to my mind about the antibiotic drug nitrofurantoin. So this is an antibiotic medication that is only available in oral form, so there is no intravenous form, so I'll write PO for oral, and its sole use is to treat urinary tract infections. So it's an antibiotic for UTIs or urinary tract infections, which means infection of the bladder. So another word for it is cystitis. And usually the bug that causes cystitis, there are different bugs that can cause cystitis, but the main one, it's normally E. coli. And against that bug, nitrofurantoin is effective. Um, there will be some um, strains of E. coli which are resistant to nitrofurantoin, but often if you have an E. coli UTI, nitrofurantoin is incredibly effective against it. If you have different types of UTIs, um, stranger bugs, then nitrofurantoin might not be effective. But as I say, this is the most common cause of UTI, and against this, nitrofurantoin is nearly always effective. Firstly, let me also just say something about the name of nitrofurantoin. Because it's a bit of a mouthful, we can abbreviate it down to nitro, so often that's a dumb thing. People will say, put the patient on three days of nitro, and that means nitrofurantoin. So that's the main abbreviation for the name that you should know. Let's also talk about dose. So there are two different types of tablet or capsule. I don't in fact actually know whether it's a tablet or a capsule, uh, but there are two different types anyway. There's an immediate release formulation available and there's a modified release formulation available. If you give the person the immediate release type, then the dose is 50 milligrams, but you have to take it four times a day. Whereas if you take the modified release type, the frequency goes down to twice daily, so BD, uh, and then the dose that you take on those two occasions is doubled. So you take 100 milligrams twice daily, or you can take 50 milligrams four times a day if you take the immediate release uh, preparation. As I say, it's only available as an oral form. There is no intravenous form. And the reason this drug can only be used to treat UTIs is actually quite interesting. So it doesn't at least this is my understanding of how it works, it doesn't actually get activated to its active form where it's actually toxic to bacteria and capable of killing bacteria until it ex gets excreted by the kidneys. So let's just draw a picture. So this can be a kidney, a quite badly drawn kidney here, but a kidney nonetheless. There's the ureter coming out here. So You'll take the drug orally, so it'll go into the GI tract, and in the GI tract it will get absorbed into the bloodstream, and then the drug will circulate around the bloodstream, and then it will be excreted by the kidneys into the urine. And my understanding is that when the kidneys excrete it into the urine, they modify it in some way, change it into some slightly different compound, and that compound is then the active drug. It's then in the urine, and it's capable of killing bacteria. So Whilst it's circulating in the bloodstream, my understanding is it's not actually capable of killing bacteria. Even if there are some bacteria in your bloodstream, it won't be effective against them, even if they're E. coli, because it has to be activated into the active form by the kidneys and then excreted into the urine, and then it's active. And then it's capable of killing any bacteria that it meets in the urinary tract. So if it meets some bacteria in the ureter, it'll poison them. If it meets some bacteria in the bladder, so we complete our picture here. So the ureter comes down and then joins the bladder here. Oh, and then there'll be another ureter, of course, here. And then the bladder will come down into the urethra, which is a bit thick, but never mind. Um, so that's the reason it can only be used to treat UTIs and isn't effective against infections in other places, because it's only going to be excreted, uh, sorry, because it only gets activated once it's been excreted by the kidneys. It also means that for this drug to be effective, your kidneys have to be quite good. If you've got kidney disease, that means that your kidneys are bad, then this drug, A, might not get excreted into the urine, or B, might not get activated properly by the kidneys. So for this reason, the clinical threshold that we usually have for giving someone uh, nitrofurantoin to treat a UTI is 45 
um, or, or their EGFR, sorry, has to be 45. Um, and I think that must be milliliters per minute. I'm forgetting the units of EGFR, but I assume that that means milliliters per minute. Or would, would it be liters? Estimated glomerular filtration rate. It can't be liters. That would be far too much. 45 liters. No, it must be milliliters and it must be per minute. So I think that's the units of EGFR. So just in case you don't know, EGFR stands for estimated and then GFR stands for glomerular filtration rate. And this is something that we can't actually measure glomerular filtration rate. So instead we estimate it and that's what EGFR is. And it means you have your two kidneys. I've got a picture of one here, but there'll be another one here. Blood is going through both of your kidneys all the time, and you have loads of little nephrons with their glomeruli. And those glomeruli, um, the blood is moved alongside them, and from the blood, in fact, I should draw a picture of this. So if we take a nephron out of this kidney, then it has a structure kind of like this. This is the... Um, Omen's capsule, I think, and then, in fact, I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to remember all the different bits of the nephron. Um, I think this is, oh, I'll try anyway. I think this is the proximal convoluted tubule, and then the loop of Henle, if I remember rightly, and then you have a distal convoluted tubule. It doesn't matter anyway. We've got the bit that we need, and then it goes on, and it goes into some collecting duct. Anyway, the bit that we need is this bit, the Bowman's capsule, and then you have uh, a bunch of blood vessels here. So we'll have them here, lots of them there, so there are a bunch of them. Uh, and this bunch of blood vessels here is called the glomerulus, and it's in the Bowman's capsule, and blood comes through this bunch of blood vessels, and then some of the liquid from the blood is then filtered into this start of the nephron here, which is the Bowman's capsule. The concept of the glomerular filtration rate is you have however many millions of these nephrons in both kidneys, and all the time fluid is coming from these blood vessels into the Bowman's capsule, into the nephrons. And the idea is if you could sum up all of that amount of fluid that is moving from the blood vessels into nephrons in a minute, what volume would you get? And that is what is meant by the glomerular filtration rate. It's the filtration rate of fluid into the glomeruli in your kidneys. And as I say, it's an interesting concept. It would be nice to know this number. Obviously we can't, but clever people have been able to work out methods for estimating this in a patient. And all you do is you measure certain um, levels of chemicals in the blood that should be being removed by the kidneys and depending on how high they are if they're very very high it indicates that the kidneys aren't functioning so well so you infer that the glomerular filtration rate is lower whereas if it's nice and low that means that the kidneys are working well and therefore that the glomerular filtration rate is good you also factor in things like the patient's weight and uh, height and things like that there's some fancy formula for working out EGFR from patient parameters. Anyway, the point is that you can estimate, and we do do this all the time, anyone who has basic blood tests, the computer then produces an estimated glomerular filtration rate for them. So anyone who's being admitted to hospital will have their UNEs done, and the computer estimates their GFR from that. So we have this value for most of our patients. So um, ideally, in a young, healthy person with excellent kidneys, it should be greater than 90, this value. As kidney function deteriorates, uh, which it often does in age, and especially if you've got diabetes or high blood pressure, uh, which damage the kidneys, both of those two diseases, um, then your GFR goes down. And if it's below 45, usually we say that that is too low for nitrofurantoin to be uh, an effective treatment for UTI. So we want our patients who we're going to give nitrofurantoin to to have an EGFR ideally above 45. And I would say between 30 and 45, you can probably get away with prescribing it. 
ideally it should be above 45 if it's below 45 you should choose a different thing but 30 to 45 you can probably get away with it below 30 you really shouldn't be prescribing nitrofurantoin in that case you should be prescribing something else uh, but 30 to 45 is a little bit more soft you you shouldn't but you can get away with it whereas below 30 you really really shouldn't um okay so let's summarize what we've said so far. It's an oral antibiotic. It has these two different preparations. It's used to treat UTIs. It's very effective against E. coli UTIs. It's not active in the bloodstream. It's only active once it's been excreted by the kidneys. Therefore, you need to have good kidney function for it to be effective. What else can we say about it? Oh, we can talk about how long we generally treat people for. Um, so, oh, I, my iPad's just warning me about low battery, so excuse me for a moment. So I'm back now, we're all plugged in and safe. So I was just about to talk about duration of treatment. Uh, but firstly, let's just actually say a little bit more about what a UTI actually is. So as we've already said, UTI stands for urinary tract infection, and it really means infection of the bladder. Now, these are far, far more common in women than men, at least in the younger years of life. In the later years of life, men get prostatic hypertrophy, so the prostate gets bigger, and then they have problems emptying their bladder fully, so they then end up not being able to empty their bladder fully, even when they try their hardest to empty their bladder, there will still be some urine left sat there, and that's something called chronic urinary retention, and when you have the inability to completely get rid of all that urine, that is a massive risk factor for the bladder then getting infected because, y you know, you can imagine if you're able to completely empty your bladder each time, that nicely is keeping the bladder clean. If some urine is always staying behind, then you can imagine that some of that urine might have been there for quite some time. And then if it gets infected, then it you just can't clear it. Uh, there's always going to be that urine that's infected sat there and you're unable to completely empty it out. So that's why uh, men in later years of their life are then at risk for UTIs. But in the earlier stages of life, men are much, much less likely to get UTIs. Whereas women um, can get, or it's more common to see UTIs in younger women than it is to see them in young men. And the, the reason that women are so much more at risk of UTIs than men is just because the urethra is so much shorter in women compared to men. So in men, of course, you'd have um, the penis here, and then the urethra would go throughout the whole length of the penis. Uh, and if you can imagine, the bacteria need to get up the urethra into the bladder from the outside world, up the urethra into the bladder to then cause the infection. Um, Obviously, if the urethra is much longer, the chance of that happening is much less. So that's believed to be the reason that young women get UTIs, whereas young men hardly ever get UTIs. So this is something that is common in women at all ages because of the short urethra. And then it's something that is very uncommon in younger men, but then older men do get it as a problem because of chronic urinary retention from prostatic hypertrophy. The duration of treatment, uh, or actually let's talk about the symptoms as well. So symptoms of UTI, it can make you feel generally unwell, like if you had a bad cold, for example, it would make you feel systemically unwell. UTIs can do that. Um, they can also trigger a sort of burning sensation when you pass urine. They can trigger pain in the suprapubic region, so the lower portion of the abdomen, where your sort of bladder is, you can get sort of pain in that region. Uh, pain when passing urine, as we've already said, a sort of burning sensation when you pass urine. The need to pass urine much more often than normal, so frequency. All of these are sort of symptoms of UTI. And the urine, if you actually examine it, if you get them to pee into a cup, um, it will be cloudy and bad smelling normally. And usually if someone presents me with some cloudy urine that smells awful, you can say that's going to be a UTI, but you can do further things to actually confirm that it's a UTI. So you can send the sample off. So we get like a little pot, uh, a sample pot with some urine in here. 
uh, and then we send it off to um, a laboratory uh, and they will take a sample, uh, they'll take a little bit of this urine, put it onto an agar plate and try and grow bacteria from it. Um, and that way they can actually find out which bacterium is causing the infection. So one, it confirms the infection if they manage to grow a bacteria in a large amount, you know. So if you take anyone's urine, there might be some, a few bacteria in there, but there won't be that many. Uh, in order to get a huge, great growth on the plate, you need to have a high concentration of bacteria. Um, so they'll be looking for big growths. And they can, can therefore confirm the presence of infection in this way. And they can also tell us what bacterium it is. So they can tell us, for example, if it is E. coli or whether it's something stranger. And they can tell us what antibiotics it's sensitive to. So, for example, if we've treated the patient empirically with nitrofurantone, because, you know, it takes a few days for them to do this. Uh, so if we've given the patient nitrofurantone in the meantime, then we might get this result back, say it has grown E. coli, so we've confirmed they've got an E. coli UTI, and then they'll tell us, is it sensitive to nitrofurantone or not? And if it's not sensitive to nitrofurantone, we could then uh, change the antibiotic that the patient is going to have to one that the laboratory tells us the bug is sensitive to. So that's a little bit about uh, UTIs and how we diagnose them and what sort of symptoms people get with them. People can get really, really sick with UTIs, by the way. They can make people life-threateningly ill. When a UTI makes someone really, really sick, we call that urosepsis. So sepsis means you're really, really sick from an infection. Uro means it's a urinary infection. Uh, so elderly people come in with reduced levels of consciousness, spiking fevers, really, really ill, and one of the common culprits is urosepsis. And in that case, of course, we wouldn't be treating them with nitrofurantoin. In that case, we'd be giving them intravenous antibiotic treatment, uh, which nitrofurantoin doesn't have an intravenous formulation. So we wouldn't be giving them this. This is a treatment for people who are well with their UTIs. And so UTI means, you know, not septic from it. If if they're septic from the urinary infection, we'd call that urosepsis, whereas when we call it UTI, it kind of means they're well with it. It's a simple, uncomplicated UTI. In fact, that would be the better uh, term. We're talking about treatment of uncomplicated UTIs, which means nothing really bad has happened from the infection. It's giving them symptoms. We want to help them by treating it, uh, but it's not making them really, really ill. Um, and UTIs, like, if you don't treat UTIs, the body might fight it off for itself. In fact, many UTIs that we do treat, if you didn't treat them, but in the days before antibiotics were available, these people would have got better by themselves. The infection would have, the immune system would have fought it. But the risk of not treating it is, one, that it might take them longer to get better without treatment, and two, it might not get better and it might progress to a more serious infection such as urosepsis, it might make them really unwell from it. Or the infection might go higher as well. The infection might go up the ureters into the kidneys and that's much more serious. So when the infection is in the kidneys, there's a name for that, that's called pyelonephritis and that's much more serious. It uh, usually makes people extremely septic, pyelonephritis. So th those are the reasons for treating it. But as I say, most UTIs, simple, uncomplicated UTIs, would get better by themselves even without treatment. We give them treatment because it will make it get better quicker. And usually these people might have had these symptoms for several days, if not weeks, by the time they actually go and see their GP for treatment. So uh, they tr might have already given it a period to see if it gets better by itself, and it hasn't. Um, in terms of treatment duration, so it depends actually whether the patient is male or female normally. Um, so if they are female, often the recommended treatment duration is just three days for UTI. So we'd give three days of nitrofurantoin if we were going to treat with nitrofurantoin. Um, 50 milligrams four times a day if it's immediate release, 100 milligrams twice daily if it's modified release. Whereas if it's a male UTI, the recommended duration is longer. Um, so it's recommended at seven days. Um, and I think that's usually just considered because uh, three days is usually enough to beat it in women, whereas for men, um, it's usually recommended a longer treatment duration, presumably because the infection is more difficult to 
clear in men than it is in women. One final thing to say before we finish is about the fact that you can get put on nitrofurin toe in long term. So some people who get recurrent UTIs can end up on long term prophylactic antibiotics. So if you, for example, are getting UTI every few weeks and then requiring treatment, then in your GP can put you on a long-term antibiotic that you take every single day to try and prevent you from getting UTIs. So this is called a prophylactic antibiotic. And nitrofurantoin can be used for this. So, uh, for example, I think normally they would give the modified release nitrofurantoin tablet if they were going to do this. And they'd give one tablet once a day. So it would be 100 milligrams once a day, maybe in the morning, maybe at night. Uh, to try and prevent UTIs. Now, this is something that we are going off largely. Um, so it's something that you do still see, but one, the microbiologists don't like it because it leads to the development of bugs that are resistant to the antibiotics. If you know, if someone's taking antibiotics daily, long term, it is selecting for bugs that are resistant to it. It's killing all the bugs that aren't resistant to it, and then the only bugs that survive are the ones that do happen to be resistant to it, and therefore their populations go up. So it is increasing the problem of antibiotic resistance. So it's not good for antibiotic stewardship. That's one of the reasons against it. Another reason against it is that is specific to nitrofurantoin. Nitrofurantoin has quite a horrible side effect that I want to talk about um, and this is where I want to end talking about one of the famous side effects of nitrofurantoin and it's a side effect that if you're just taking it for a few days you probably don't need to worry about but if you're taking it long term this is something to be aware of that can happen which is that it can cause lung fibrosis so your lungs are obviously the organs that you use to breathe. They are nice sort of spongy organs that um, when we breathe in, they expand nicely. And then when we breathe out, they recoil back down. They're nice and elastic. What There is a horrible disease called pulmonary fibrosis or lung fibrosis where the lung tissue the healthy lung tissue is replaced by scar tissue. That's what fibrosis is. Fibrotic tissue is scar tissue. So in this disease, the healthy lung tissue, more and more of it is gradually replaced just with scar tissue. And the scar tissue isn't beautiful elastic tissue. Instead, it's really fibrous scar tissue. So it means that when you breathe, the portions of the lung that are really fibrotic no longer expand the way they should. Um, so they just don't really expand at all, or if they do, they only expand a tiny amount. So it can then trigger real problems with breathing as this disease progresses. Uh, so it's a horrible, horrible lung condition, pulmonary fibrosis, an incurable lung condition. There are treatments that we have, tablets that you can take that try to slow down the progression of the disease, but they're not particularly effective. Uh, so it's a horrible, horrible lung condition that, if it gets advanced enough, does eventually result in death. So it's not a nice thing. And it is a condition that there is an association between long-term nitrofurantoin use and its development, i.e. if you are on long-term nitrofurantoin, the chance of you getting this condition is increased. Um, so it, it is a side effect to be aware of that the, the, you are at increased risk of getting pulmonary fibrosis if you are on long-term nitrofurantoin. And it's probably the most famous and scariest side effect of this drug. Uh, other than that, it's a very well-tolerated drug. You know, if you are just going to take three days of it, you may well get absolutely no side effects from taking this drug. Um, but the one side effect that everyone in the medical profession knows about is that it's associated with pulmonary fibrosis, especially in long-term use. Uh, so with that, we'll finish there. Thank you for watching.